In this video, I want to take a look at the programming pattern known as the state pattern. This pattern, which is particularly useful when dealing with simple to moderately complex systems, can be thought of as having different modes or distinct different behaviors. But before I get too far into the video, I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons and my YouTube channel members. Thank you for supporting the channel and the videos that I get to make. The state pattern definitely has its limitations, but like any other pattern, in the right situation, it can help to detangle code, which makes debugging and adding new features or behaviors easier and much less frustrating. You'll also hear the term finite state machine or FSM thrown around. And both of these are implementations of the state pattern. The asset Playmaker is fully based around FSMs and Bolt has state macros or state graphs that function as finite state machines. To help illustrate the state pattern, I've created a simple project where an NPC shown as a capsule needs to search the maze to collect yellow cubes. And while it's doing that, if it sees one of the red spheres, it will attack and destroy it. So take a minute and think it through. Maybe even pause the video. How would you program that particular behavior? Now, if you're just trying to prototype the behavior, or maybe you're just learning to program, your first attempt at coding this behavior will likely be with a series of if statements, which can work. If you make good use of functions and return values, you can even make the code pretty clean and pretty tidy. For example, here's code that I wrote that functions pretty well. It uses a few if statements in the update function to control the behavior. As a side note, I don't really want to go into the details of the functions themselves, as I want to focus on the architecture and the structure of how those functions are used. If you want to take a closer look at the code in the project, I'll include a link in the description below. Now, at first glance, this code is perfectly fine. And that is, if this is all your NPC will ever do. But the problem with this pattern or style of code becomes apparent as more behaviors are added. We all know that feature creep is real and that you will add more behaviors. So this is where we bring in the state pattern. Now, the state pattern is not about reducing the number of lines of code. In fact, it'll likely make your code longer. But it, rather, it's about organizing your code and adding clear delineation to which chunk of code is running. There are at least two different ways to use the state pattern that I want to look at. The first, I think, is by far the most common and was certainly the way that I implemented it when I first learned about it. The second is far more abstract, but in some ways cleaner and somewhat easier to maintain. Our first method makes use of an enum that has a value for each of the different states or behaviors of the NPC. In my example, I'll need a wander, collect, and a chase state. The base NPC class will then need an instance of an enum and in my case, I've set the default value to the wander state. Then in the update function, rather than a chain of if statements, we can use a switch statement with a case for each of the enum values. Then in each of the cases, we can call the needed function for that behavior. Already, we can start to see the organization forming. Each state has a clear chunk of code in the switch statement, and the NPC can only be in one of those states at any given time, which is great but we need a way to transition from one state to another. And this is where you may start to see the unraveling or the limitations of the state pattern. In each case, we need conditionals to determine if the state should change. And this brings back some of the ugly if statements from our earlier implementation. If we do need to change the state, we can simply change the value of the enum instance. And in the next frame, the switch statement will evaluate a different state. Now, at first glance, this may not appear to be an advantage over where we started, but there's a major advantage. When we started, we needed a way to determine which state we were in, picking from all the possible states. With this implementation of the state pattern, we only need to decide if we need to change states, given that we are already in a particular state. This greatly simplifies the decision, albeit at the cost of a few extra lines of code. Add to this that in the system, it's common for a given state to only transition to a limited number of other states. For example, in my case, if I don't want the NPC to stop collecting if it sees a red sphere, and it should only attack a sphere if there's no nearby cube to collect. If that's the case, the state pattern may actually reduce the amount of code needed, as well as serving to untangle the code. This implementation of an FSM can be used for all kinds of different behaviors. It can be used to control animations, background music, or even which UI elements are being displayed at a given time. In my personal project, I use a vaguely similar approach that makes use of static enums and events for game modes so that various managers and UI elements can act or react based on the state of the game. The clarity of being in exactly one state has greatly simplified my code and made it far less error prone. So this is all well and good, but you may be able to see that the end result of this approach when the number of states gets large is still a complicated mess. All the state switching is in this one update function 
which can quickly get unmanageable and not to mention pretty ugly. So we can take the state pattern a step further. This step is more abstract, still imperfect, but it does buy us something in terms of untangling the code and cleaning up the implementation. This step is going to take each state and place it into its own class. Each state can then be in control of itself and will determine when to make a transition. And each state will also determine which state to transition to for the next frame. The first step is to create a new interface, which for my case, I'll call INBC state. This interface will have one function called do state that will have one input parameter and also a return value. This function will be called by the NPC base class to run the state's behavior. The input parameter is there so the NPC can pass in a reference to itself so the state can have access to any of the necessary variables on the NPC. And finally, the return value is used so that the NPC or whatever your code is for will know which state to be in for the next frame. And with that done, we need to create a new class for each state and those classes need to implement our newly created INPC state interface. I've moved all the functions and used each state into the corresponding class. This can cause some redundancy with functions, but I think the overall organization of having each state tucked away into its own class and file are well worth the potential redundancy. I've also chosen to leave the variables on the base class itself. This allows the base class to be passed into each state, which in turn provides access to all the data needed for that state. This is done at the cost of making those variables public. Now each state will need to have its own do state function fully implemented. But before we do that, let's head back to the base NPC class, as this needs to be restructured and its restructuring will help us to understand what needs to be done in each of the do state functions. Looking at the new base class, the impact is pretty dramatic in the reduction of the complexity of the code. But at the same time, things have gotten far more abstract, so let's take a walk through it. We can see a variable for the current state. This is of the type INPC state, so that it can store reference to any of our newly created state classes. Next, there is an instance of each of the states that will be used by the NPC. Note that I've created a new instance of each state so the values won't be null. In the onEnable function, the current state is set to the wander state to initialize the NPC's starting state. Then in our wonderfully short update function, we'll call doState on the current state and set the current state to the return value. What this means is the current state will do its thing and then determine what state the NPC will be in for the next frame. If you let that sink in, it's pretty darn clever. And in some senses, the entire update function of the NPC is changed depending on which state is currently running. Next, let's return to the individual states and implement the doState function. In the example of the attack state, I'll check to make sure that the nav agent is not null. And if it is, we'll get the nav agent component off the NPC. After that, it's just a matter of running the attack code and then using similar logic to our earlier FSM implementation to decide which state should be used in the next frame. The biggest difference here is that we are returning a state that is already on the NPC. And if there is no state change, we're returning the same state that is currently running. We can add similar functionality to the wander and to the collect state, and that's pretty much it. Our abstract but behaviorally simple FSM is complete. If we wanted to add an additional state, we would need to create a new class, add an instance of our class to the base NPC, and allow other states to transition to that new state. As long as the number of states stays fairly small, meaning five or 10, this is a pretty clean solution. So let's talk about the downsides to the state pattern. Clearly, if the system gets too complex, it will quickly become hard to work with or maintain and a solution such as a behavior tree will be a better fit. Also, by keeping all the variables for states on the base class, this allows the state themselves to stay cleaner, but as mentioned earlier, it does come at the cost of making the variables public. This could be partially resolved by creating an additional class to serve as a data container. This sort of just passes the buck, but would result in fewer publicly accessible variables on the NPC itself. Using a data container would also open the doors a bit wider to allow these states to be used or reused by other entities so that an additional wander state for each type of NPC would not need to be created. So there you go. That's a quick look at the state pattern. If you want to learn more, there are plenty of other online resources, but I also encourage you to take a look at the book Game Programming Patterns as it offers a more detailed dive. So I hope this has been interesting or better yet useful for you and your project. And until next time, happy game designing. And my hands are in the air, so it's hard.
We'll do call. Ah. 